we're going to kick off with panel two. Uh, the title of this panel is Community Reciprocity and Sustainability. What are the key components and conditions for building social resilience? We are joined by four really wonderful speakers, leaders, academics, researchers, you name it, um, solution architects, uh, Tisha Holmes, Adrian Hampton, Brian McInnes, and Beth Sowen. I'm so grateful to all of you for being here, for bringing your important and unique perspective and experience as experts. And I'm gonna hand it over to Tisha. Dr. Tisha Holmes is an associate professor in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at Florida State University. Her research examines the social and institutional factors that influence resilience to environmental hazards in vulnerable and marginalized communities. She focuses and emphasizes acti active community participation in research, education, and decision making. Um, and she has a particular interest in exploring the intersections of climate change, adaptation planning, health equity, and social welfare. Her work and her advice has been so important to us while we were building the RITA Summit in helping us understand and connect public health with climate resilience and public policy. We are so thrilled to have her here. Welcome. Thank you so much, Dekela. Um, good day, everyone. Just really glad to be here with you all, and I hope you're enjoying the summit so far. Um, I'm going to be moderating today's session, so I'm here to also learn um, from our wonderful uh, panelists today. They bring a, a, a range of expertise and perspectives. So what I'd like to do is sort of hand it off to each panelist to introduce themselves. Um, so maybe we can start with Adrienne Hampton. You're the first box um, on top for me. Um, my name is Adrienne Hampton. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a family physician at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, and a Zen practitioner um, with some teaching responsibility in my school. And um, also a large part of my um, academic uh, duties and responsibilities center around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So those are the capacities in which I'm showing up and I'm really happy to be here and I'll pass it off to Beth because you're next on my screen. Hi everyone, my name is Beth Sowen. Um, I'm the founder and director of Multi-Solving Institute, which is a, we call ourselves a think do tank focused on the kinds of solutions that solve multiple problems at the same time. Um, my training is in um, systems theory, systems analysis. I started out as a biologist, and that affects a lot of how I think about things as well. So really happy to be here and um, engage in some conversation today. And I'll pass it to Brian. Uh, for sure. Greetings. Hello, everyone. My name is Brian McGinnis. Uh, I work with the University of Wisconsin and by training, uh, I'm an anthropologist and educator. So Happy to be here today to be able to share a little bit of the work that I've been able to be doing in Wisconsin, Indian communities, indigenous communities with young people exploring this very notion of resilience and how we build and support healthy and strong communities. Thank you. Um, miigwech. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I'm so glad to have you all on this panel and really looking forward um, to learning from you. So. Uh, now, in terms of the process, we're going to start off before we um, open it up to the panelists to give their presentations um, with a reflective exercise. So if everybody online um, can maybe sort of indulge us um, to sort of go through a reflective exercise to center ourselves before we start unpacking these thick and complex concepts. So let's take a few centering breaths and then we bring to mind a person or a group of people um, in your ancestry who's displayed resilience or helped others be more resilient. And if you have a notebook or a piece of paper, you might write down a few words or sentences or even sketch an image that really captures them and their qualities of resilience in mind. And we really can kind of, you know, remember this that you know, in its long history in terms of life, we faced many challenges and we are all inheritors of that strength and the resilience that we draw on today. So let's take a couple of minutes to do that, center ourselves, and if anyone would like to share, please feel free to do so.
All right. So would anyone, including our panelists, like to share? No pressure, of course. I could share. Thank you, Tisha. Um, actually, two things came to mind for me. One, relatively recent, my grandmother, um, who became a mother at a really young age of three children and built a house out of... Um, recycled materials, including uh, the nails they used, she would um, get from scrap lumber and straighten um, and put together to, to build a house. So whenever I feel stuck, I think about how many nails must be in a house. And I remember that I come from that. Um, I also thought about really, really distant ancestry and all of the moments in life's history, like the first multicellular organism, the oxygen crisis, the the meteorites, the extinctions, like all of that is in my ancestry too. Um, and, and I think about that sometimes as well. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. Anyone else? I actually would love just to share one quick uh, thing, if I may. Uh, I have spent, you know, the last, I'd say, six weeks or so just traveling to different communities around Wisconsin. And uh, while I originally, you know, was born and grew up in Canada, um, but I've been in the United States now since about 2000, it has been this amazingly reconnective experience just knowing that I had great grandparents who went to Canada during the Indian relocation era and had to forfeit their lives here. But I guess I really came to appreciate that uh, ability and that privilege to be able to live here, to work here, to be here um, as a citizen, as someone who belongs here and can belong here in a way that is unchallenged uh, in the present. And also I think as importantly, finding what it means to rebuild relationships, however distant, and how special that is about our human experience here in the world that we, we do have relatives everywhere. If we begin to look, reach out, connect, and how amazing it is to rebuild that. So it's um, one thing I just wanted to mention. Wonderful, thank you, Brian. Okay, um, thank you both for sharing. And as we you know, sort of move forward into the discussion, feel free for those of you online um, to add your stories to the chat. Um, we have one from Kayla, if everyone um, isn't able to see it, I can just read it out if that's all right. Um, I think of how we are all stardust and thus a part of the universe. I think about my African-American ancestors who survived ap ap apocalyptic I'm sorry, conditions through enslavement. I think about Mother Earth, who is resilient when given the rest and compassion she deserves, i.e. increase in biodiversity in Chernobyl when that land was left untouched. Thanks, Kyla. Okay, so now let's shift um, just gently to um, talking about community resilience and what that means, sort of the focus of this panel. Now, um, as a term, it's become part of our general lexicon, um, but its meaning can change with time, um, with the, the changes in the context, the changes in our environment, um, but also specifically those who are framing those conceptions, right? Um, so we've asked each of our panelists to share their thoughts about um, for about 15 minutes, and then we can shift into questions and discussion with the audience um, based on what we've heard. So panelists, um, if we can sort of go one by one, can you sort of tell us how do you feel that we should define community resilience? What are those conditions that are necessary um, for community resilience? And then how do these conditions address and incorporate intersectionalities around things like identities of race, class, gender, and so forth? Um, who would like to get us started? I can also call an L in order. Adrian, would you like to get us started? All right, great, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, um, thank you for that opportunity to reflect on my lineage and those beings and people who have come before. Um, I am, um, Excited to be here participating in this discussion about fostering resilience in communities as we experience and confront a changing climate. 
Um, and by way of departure, I'd like to start with some reflection. And so if you would close your eyes and then just thinking, feeling, experiencing what comes up when you think about your community. Feeling into what bubbles up to the surface with this word community. And then as you're ready, just opening your eyes. Thank you. So when we think about a definition for community, we're thinking about people with common interests living in a particular area. And um, I would submit that that is highly subjective. Um, and sometimes in the US problematically subjective. Um, what I notice in myself, when I think about community generally, I think about groups of belonging that follow racial, ethnic, or sometimes queer lines of identity. Um, and that it is not necessarily grounded in place. And when I think of community resilience in the face of climate change, natural disasters, <laughs> um, uh, problems that will ensue that are expected to ensue as the world warms are necessarily predicated on place. So that people in geographic proximity to one another um will be facing similar circumstances despite their feelings of connection or disconnection despite their feelings of community engagement disenfranchisement despite their level of empowerment in their vicinity and so i think that geographical proximity think, thinking and feeling into community in that way is going to require some heart work and is going to be a stretch for a lot of people in this country. Um, I want to spend some time talking about um, an assertion from two Tulane sociologists um, who wrote that while diverse and relatively new, literature around issues of environmental justice builds from the core premise that communities and regions are not homogenous unified systems but rather mosaics of overlapping subsystems cross-cut by social and economic inequalities. So that people sharing place are not necessary, necessarily sharing resources or experience. So now I'll invite you to close your eyes again. And we'll take three deep and centering breaths. And now I want us to focus on place. And when you feel into place, where you call home, where you work, where you shop, where you frequent. So 
anywhere in the realm of place do you observe inequity? All right. So now um, I want us to consider that America is more racially segregated today than it was in 1990. That, for example, Detroit is 80% black, but there is an adjacent suburb that is 90% white. And this trend is common in the United States. In our largest cities, people of different races and ethnicities live in islands a lot of the time that don't appreciably mix. And there's evidence that the social determinants of health show up completely differently in these islands. Um, as an example, in New York City, Blacks and folks born in Latin America experience much higher rates of excess deaths from COVID than their affluent white neighbors. In Chicago, the average life expectancy for a Black man is 68. For a white man is 77 and for a Hispanic man is 82. And while we know that assignment to racialize groups mediates our life experience, the construct of race has no biological basis. And low SES, regardless of race, is a predictor of ill health status and early death in the United States. So often when we are talking and thinking about communities in the US, we are talking about groups of people with similar racial and ethnic backgrounds and or who experience similar SES, health status and or mortality rates. We're not speaking simply of people who share place. We don't historically allocate resources equitably from a geographic perspective. And separate resource rich and resource poor communities exist side by side. But again, when we think about climate change and we think about the effects of that, these things strike place. So a large question in my mind as I consider community res resilience is how do we shift to see a community where the criteria for belonging are interdependence and proximity? because these are the factors that will matter when climate change affects place. Um, often natural disasters tend to exacerbate systemic inequity with some of the starkest disparities existing between blacks and whites for reasons traceable to slavery and the intentional organization of society over the history of the United States. Um, certainly those are not the only disparities. Um, but following a natural disaster, when FEMA intervenes, white folks on average find their wealth increasing by about $126,000 on average, where black people can expect to see their income fall by about $27,000. Before Hurricane Katrina, low income black residents of New Orleans were less likely to evacuate and die in disproportionate numbers. Following Hurricane Katrina and the devastation of New Orleans, black workers were about four times as likely to report having lost their pre Katrina job following the storm as white workers. And consequently, the rebuilding of New Orleans has been indicted for being characterized in large part by gentrification and an outward migration of low income blacks. So how do we form communities of place and what do they need to be resilient in this time? First and foremost, I believe that people in physical proximity to one another need to recognize and invest in their common interests and interdependence, which we have largely avoided in our society. I think this requires practice because it goes against the divisive conditioning that advantages white people in the United States, but to which we're all subject in the United States, again, owing to our history. 
I think we have guidance from the meditative disciplines of India and Asia. Making a practice of loving kindness is one way forward. And I'd like to practice that now. <laughs> so I'll invite you to set eyes open or closed, however you're most comfortable. And just notice what ensues as you hear these words. May I be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I live with ease. And then extending your awareness to someone dear to you, someone as close as breath to you. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you live with ease. And then someone of whom you're fond. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you live with ease. And then someone about whom you feel neutral, not positive, not negative. May you be safe and happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. Next, bringing someone with whom you find relating difficult into your awareness. Sending them these words, this sentiment, this feeling. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And may you live with ease. And then bringing to mind someone in your vicinity, someone who shares place with you. May you be safe. May you be happy. May you be healthy. May you live with ease. And finally, bringing in all people, all beings. May we all be safe. May we all be happy. May we all be healthy. And may we all live with ease.
and bringing that practice to a close. Thank you for practicing with me together. The next thing I would submit um, is something that I really appreciate in my workplace that I think has shifted the way that our work community makes decisions and responds to challenges. Um, and so I would offer that to this, to this audience as well. Um, and that is we have started to apply an equity lens to our collective decisions. And this is a process of interrogating our decision making to ensure we consider the interests and needs and opinions and potential consequences of community actions for low income and or minoritized groups. And this can be applied, as I said, in a workplace. There are equity lenses um, specifically with a, with a bent toward policy. There are some that are easier to personalize in our personal circles of caring and awareness as we make decisions. Um, and at first, I think it can feel cumbersome to look at each time we're making a decision about whether we're going to have lunch at 11.30 or noon, who is impacted, who are the voices at the table, who is not present um, and, and speaking and opining, um, and thinking, feeling into our purpose with these decision making, um, with this decision making, um, and evaluating our process. Um, but it does start to become second nature, is what I mean by practice. Sort of like loving kindness meditation with practice can become second nature and can start to change the way that we relate to the world. I've seen the equity lens start to change our department and the way we relate to one another and to our patients um, as we make decisions um, at all levels. Um, from who's going to run our clinics, who's going to staff them, how we're going to allocate patient panels. It's been a beautiful thing. And I'm happy to put an example of one in the chat. I think I'm short on time, so I won't go through it. But, um, and in closing, I would just say that I believe that we have to notice and care for and be able to connect with the people in our vicinity to confront the challenges of a changing climate. All of the definitions and models we see for community resilience are predicated on an awareness, a mutuality, mutual respect. Um, geography will put us in the path of climate related problems. Um, but our connections with one another will dictate our responses to and our experience of the world as it changes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shall Dr. Hampton. That was excellent. <laughs> Can you hear us? Yes. Okay, great. That was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we wanna hold the questions off um, but just to sort of like reiterate a couple of um, sort of really important takeaways or points that I got from the process and the exercises, but also what you were um, speaking on is the um, investment in building common interests and interdependence. Um, thinking about how we break down those silos and the conditioning that hold us, um, you know, in, in a status quo, essentially se se separate, segregated and disconnected. Um, building kindness to each other, even if we don't, you know, initially feel like we should be kind to one another, which I think is really hard. That last uh, exercise of extending, you know, wellness and, and gifts to those who may not necessarily care for me um, was particularly tough, but I understand why we need to do that. 
um, and then also addressing sort of equity and inequities through policy and practice. Um, I think those are some of the really key takeaways um, and hopefully we'll have some more um, opportunity to um, unpack that in the discussion. All right, um, Beth, would you like to go next? Yeah, happy to. Um, thank you, Adrian. That was beautiful. Um, let's see one second. So I want to share four really simple things um, with the time that I have, four principles that are that I think are important for building community resilience. And I'll get to those four quickly, but I think they'll make more sense to you if I give you two pieces of background first. Um, so the first one is to locate myself for you. So I live in the US state of Vermont and we have been getting slammed with climate change impacts this summer. Some of those have made the national news, at least in the US, um, but some of them haven't. And uh, I would, I think it's fair to say it's still ongoing here. Um, so to help you picture some of what is on my mind as I think about these four principles, um, I would have you imagine a small mountainous state with most of um, the people in the state living in the river valleys. Um, and that's especially true for the least affluent people in my state. The affordable housing tends to be in the river valleys. Um, and then picture a really rainy month of June so that the soils are already loaded fully, more than fully with water. And then picture in one weekend in early July, six to nine inches of rain, depending where you are in the state, falling over the course of just a few days. And to put that in perspective, four to five inches across the whole month is, is the old normal that we're built around. Um, and so that early July flooding was what made the national news, but it really hasn't stopped. We've had storm after storm since then, um, including one last week that dropped six inches of rain on a different part of the state. Um, it rained where I live um, all night last night. And so the, my thoughts this afternoon, you'll hear this reality in Vermont and I'll use it as a few examples, but um, what I'm trying to do is use those specifics of my place to name what I think are general principles that, that I hope could be applied everywhere. So please, listen beyond the specifics um, for what those examples might mean in your place. And the second piece of background is to explain this idea of multi-solving, which our organization, Multi-Solving Institute, is, is dedicated to. When we say multi-solving, we mean doing things in a way that your efforts solve several problems at once. Um, and if you take anything from what I'm gonna say today uh, away, I think it should be this, that that I think there's a lot of evidence we can build resilience in a way that accomplishes other things at the same time, and particularly for our communities. And I think that matters because climate change isn't the only crisis that we face. Um, and there's not enough time, I don't think, or enough money to tackle each of those crises one by one. Um, but what I invite you to consider is that there might be possibilities that open up when we think about taking them on together. So the four principles I want to offer are about how we might build resilience in our communities for shocks in ways that also make our communities healthier when we're not in a shock in a moment, um, when we, where we can be more vibrant, more healthy, more connected all the time. Uh, so the first of those principles I would offer is to work with nature. Um, an example from Vermont, the Otter Creek is a, is a major waterway in the western part of the state. And in previous flooding, it caused a lot of damage. Um, we had a tropical storm in 2011 that was, uh, the Otter Creek flooded badly. <clears throat> Excuse me, but just a, upstream of one town, um, there's a conserved wetland that soaked up and slowed down the water. And so upstream of the wetland, lots of devastation. Downstream, um, pretty gentle, the water got slowed by that wetland. So that's resilience, um, but that conserved wetland is, is meeting other needs too. 
Uh, it's improving water quality. It's providing beauty and recreation for the humans of that bioregion. Habitat, of course, for many species. Um, and wetlands aren't the only example. Living shorelines, uh, reforestation projects, ecosystem restoration. These are all examples of working with nature to build resilience, but bringing along other benefits too. Um, and maybe remember this if you stay for the, the next panel, which I know is about planetary resilience, you can maybe start to see some connections from community to planetary mediated by nature. So that I would say is, is the first principle I'd like you to consider. Um, the second one I would say is supporting a strong social fabric. Um, in Vermont's flooding, I'd say we're seeing what people see in every disaster, which is the first responders, our neighbors, their local businesses, their local community serving organizations like food pantries and churches. Um, right now in Vermont, these organizations are the ones who know who needs help and they know who wants to help and they know how to connect those two. But of course, this social fabric um, is doing other really, really important things most of the time um, beyond responding to disasters. It's what feeds many people and cares for them 365 days a year, year after year, not just in climate shocks. So investing in this fabric builds resilience but it does it in a multi-solving way because it pays off every day as well. Um, and if we think back also to the mornings panel on individual resilience, um, of course, we, we heard again and again, that's not separate from community resilience. And so this strong social fabric feeds you know, down to the next nested le level of the individual or of families, um, as well as being a community-wide source of resilience. The third principle that I would lift up um, is to is to work to make societies more equitable. Um, and so some some uh, resonance with what Adrian was having us think about. Um, inequitable societies we know have these places that are neglected or actively harmed. Um, we think of them as sacrifice zones or as extraction zones or underinvested places all of these places where some lives don't matter as much as others. And of course, these places are also frequently, maybe always, um, climate risk zones too. In Vermont, that looks like the affordable housing being in the floodplain. Um, so there was a disproportionate destruction of affordable housing um, in our flood event. Uh, the exact measure of that's not, not known yet, but the trend's already clear to the people on the ground looking at it. Um, and so a, a more equitable society, one where all people matter, wouldn't have these unresilient places, right? It would invest in all places and be prepared for impacts in all places. Um, but that kind of priority isn't, again, is not only about disaster resilience because increasing equity isn't just a resilience measure. Um, there's so much scholarship on this. I think of the book um, by Heather McGee a few years ago, The Sum of Us, where she talked about all the ways that equitable societies are better for everyone in them, that they have higher overall well-being and stronger economies and are more efficient. Um, so investing in equity is another resilience measure that benefits us all the time, I would argue. And then the fourth one um, I would name and have you all consider is getting off of fossil fuels. Um, there are limits, and I think we're already seeing them, to what societies can cope with. Um, no matter how equitable, how strong the social fabric, how much nature is being worked with, if you receive a month's worth of rain in a day, and if that happens multiple times in a month, there's some point where coping gets really, really, really difficult. Um, and that's not just for flooding, of course, right? That's the same for heat waves or wildfire smoke or droughts or storm surges. Um, there's limits to what we can cope with. And so we can't keep take our eyes off addressing the root cause. Um, so going fossil free is needed for all these other resilience measures to work. But of course, it's also multi-solving. Um, it brings so many other benefits, especially in health and especially from reducing air pollution. Um, the World Health Organization 
puts out a report almost every year where they say the health benefits of meeting the Paris climate goals would more than outweigh their costs. And that's predominantly because of the um, how, how good for our health and our children's health um, uh, getting, getting free of fossil fuels would be. So I'll just, uh, to close, reiterate those four principles one more time. Um, so first, working with nature. Second, strengthening the social fabric. Third, boosting equity. And fourth, getting free of fossil fuels. And the amazing thing to me, I think this is amazing. The amazing thing is that these four don't stand alone. Like each of them alone has all of these many benefits. That's why we call them multi-solving. But they also interact with each other, these four. They lift each other up, they combine. Um, so communities can become more cohesive because of how they're working together to restore an ecosystem. Societies can become more equitable because the way they're getting off of fossil fuels is intentionally creating good jobs and pathways to them in previously marginalized communities. And so that's a vision that I wanna leave you with, um, that what we must do to create resilience has the power to make our communities so much more vibrant, so much more healthy, and so much more whole. Um, that they'd be amazing things to do, even if we didn't face a planetary emergency. Thanks. Excellent, Beth. Thank you so much for sharing this um, wonderful vision of what we hope that we can design and repair and reconstruct our communities to look like with these four um, really important principles and sort of decarbonization as the foundation of it. All right, um, Brian, would you are gonna close us out, round us out before we get into the discussion phase. You are on mute, there you Wonderful. go. Wonderful, <laughs> thank you so much, Tisha. That still happens. <laughs> And I just wanted to check, is my audio coming through okay? Yep. Fantastic. Okay, thank you all. Um, I wanted to do a little bit of initial reflection here. Just, you know, one of the things about that term resilience that, you know, and there's, again, such myriad ways we can think about that, define that and give meaning to that. But there there also is sort of, you know, I guess what I initially came into the thought about participating in a panel that was dealing with resilience and thinking about climate change and thinking about community. It was interesting in that as I was looking up definitions for that, and I will say also, I love the way that, you know, there are some very, I think, far reaching uh, multi-level definitions that have been offered and ways to think about that concept, which I, I very much appreciate and that are very open to different cultural interpretations of the term, that it actually made me devote a lot of my preparation for this very day to talking with some of the populations that I've had opportunity to be doing just some research work in communities with uh, around these topics more broadly of, you know, climate change and community adaptation, but beginning to think about, you know, local ways that many of the indigenous communities in this part of the world, this Great Lakes region, are addressing the larger concept of resilience and what that means to the community groups themselves. Um, not the definitions I was bringing in as a researcher or a community supporter, but how people in those communities were thinking about those terms through their own lenses and in many cases through their own languages. So it's been a pretty fascinating journey that way. Um, I'll just begin here very briefly by just noting um, I do come from the uh, Wasoxing First Nation, a uh, small Ojibwe community in Ontario, Canada. I have lived in the greater United States region since about 2001 and, um, and truly loved being in these territories that my ancestors found home both sides of what we call the medicine line. So very um, honored to be able to speak from this place here today in Wisconsin. Uh, about specifically, again, some of the work I've been able to do with many of the local communities, but I wanted just to honor that place that I was born, that I grew up, uh, Wasoxing, uh, Perry Island, Ontario, and just thinking about the, uh, the sacred connection that I have to the earth in that place, uh, being born there, having done my, uh, my fast there, my umbilical cord is buried there, 
and that kind of grounding that you get from from the earth and and the kinds of um, I think lifelong resilience and connection that that gives you and I wanted to honor that uh, that cultural important cultural link that I feel uh, does sustain a lot of my work and especially my strength through these very trying kinds of times that we've had and you know one thing that was also very apparent to me in all of this as we were you know doing work this summer and addressing all of these topics was still realizing the very real effect that covid the covid-19 pandemic has had on our communities and there still seems to be um, a lot of of well-founded residual trauma from that experience and caution even going forward um working as i do in communities that often do have a lot of um, you know health um, related uh, worries uh, for very for much of our population that still keeping ourselves well, keeping ourselves healthy, keeping ourselves protected uh, is still a very necessary community measure and community reality. So that was just one thing I wanted to say that as you know we're coming out of you know COVID nineteen as a global community and suddenly being presented with this notion of climate change very upfront, very quickly very readily, it's almost kind of this, this double whammy of uh, effect, I think that we're getting uh, of trauma that we're experiencing and beginning to think about. But it was fascinating in that many of the, the communities that I had opportunity to visit and talk with, how this whole notion of climate change has been, you know, very closely noted by by elders, by community workers, by youth for many, many years. And I think one of the greatest indices and markers of that that we had was we were thinking about even the way that we talked about our worlds, the way that we talked about the change and flow of time, even through moon cycles. And of course, in many indigenous languages, uh, the moons are classically named for activities that characterize the life cycle of our peoples during that time frame, whether it's the spawning of fish or the uh, blooming of a flower or the ripening of a certain kind of food or a cultural practice like wild ricing or hunting moons. Um, and all of those are very, of course, dependent upon the cycles of the land, the cycles of nature and our ability to, to be dependent upon knowing when those cycles are. And so, of course, the moon cycles have been predictive things of those for millennia for indigenous peoples in this part of, this, of the world, thousands of years. But it's been interesting as communities have commented that they've seen shifts in that for, you know, at least 10, 20 years now that suddenly, you know, the moon when the lake water is supposed to freeze, it doesn't always happen. And moons when, you know, even flowers are supposed to begin to bloom and form buds, that we begin to get late cycle freezing cycles that were not characteristic of earlier epochs of our experience. So a, a lot of almost land trauma also beginning to happen. And that was certainly something that was impacting peoples and communities that, you know, for many of our indigenous communities in rural parts of the world, um, food access, food availability has always been an issue. So having that connection to the earth, to the natural foods that we have always eaten and found sustenance from um, has always been important. So seeing these changes begin to happen um, has had major impacts for many of our communities and this adaptation, this resilience that we've needed has also had to extend from ourselves to the earth and how we as human beings can support the uh, improvement to land cycles and land healing. So many, many multifaceted ways of thinking about this. But a couple of the words that I, I wanted just to share, a couple of the things that I learned and found from community, as I talked to the notion of resilience, what resilience means to communities that I was working with to themselves, uh, because it's such, again, such a big word. And today it's almost as vast and nebulous a word as culture. When we think, what does culture mean? Um, it's such a huge construct that uh -oh. it's really hard to give uh, one Brian, definition to, but in terms of bit. thinking about things to make, okay, just to finish the talk part, I just cut my video for a second, but I hope, hopefully this improves the audio quality a little. So I'll just kind of continue along with that. 
Uh, but I just wanted to note that some of the things that I was able to learn from, you know, young people and elders and communities, when I was asking, what is resilience to you? What does resilience mean to your community? What does resilience mean to your work? Uh, one of the big things that I was hearing cross-culturally in different Indigenous groups was they said one of the things that it has to be is it has to be about kindness in this time, um, coming out of sort of one major global stress and moving into another, uh, that we need to be kind to ourselves and kind to others. It, it also was talking about the concept of finding a place of belonging and help other people belong to both place and to people. And there was one, I, I always draw on this uh, from uh, a great uh, Lakota psychologist, uh, Dr. Martin Brokenleg, as he talks about that notion of belonging, he always relates that to the places that we are. And he says, it's really important that wherever we are, that we, we learn to, and that we help others and that we make medicine, something which makes goodness in the world happen, that we make that wherever it is that we are, we find ways to create that medicine and extend it to others. Uh, other constructs I heard that related to this notion of resiliency uh, were about love, reciprocal love for each other, were about helping each other. Uh, it didn't necessarily have to be that we were helped, but that we were extending that still to the, um, the greater world, that we were showing that good spirit, we were showing that kindness. Um, there was also a sense that resilience was, it was strength. It was strength of our physical beings, but it was also a strength of our spirits and that we nurture that, we grow that, and that we extend that to others. Uh, resilience was also talked about in terms of being, being careful and being determined. And interestingly, in many of the indigenous languages we were working with, that was actually the same term. In my own language, Ojibwe, Ayangwamazin, was the term that we were using. It also had to be about enthusiasm and, and finding that, um, that purpose and that reason for life again in the world, that gishibendamawin as it was called. So resilience was not just this one simple definition or term, it became this very multifaceted way to think about it. And in the end, when I asked people to see how could we encapsulate this into one central idea, one central noun, if you will, that would describe it all. It was interesting that the dominant answer I got was in the form of a verb, an active verb that was also expressed as an imperative structure. And the general term that I got was this notion of let's stand strong and tall together and help each other stand strong and well and do that in a way that is reciprocal and reciprocated. So it was just these very powerful ways that community wanted to express that, um, thinking about land, thinking about culture, thinking about the earth. And what I also found very inspiring in all of this was that, so during this time of COVID, this time of profound disconnection, as we were beginning to see also these, you know, really strong changes in the earth and in the world, that so many of the communities that I have privileged to work with began to find ways to reconnect with the earth during this time. Um, gardening, community gardening became suddenly a very important feature. Bringing youth back to the earth through activities of, of re-engaging in fishing practices and hunting practices uh, in respectful good ways that we know how to do those things became this really powerful way to engage with each other, to find belonging, find relationship back to the earth, build respect and build our cultural sense of identities again with the world. And it was something that was really powerful for our young people, our youth, who in many, uh, you know, the last couple of decades as fishing and community hunting practices have greatly diminished. Um, it was a way that they began to feel more positive about their identity, uh, about this way of helping build the resilience, not only of their cultural selves, but also of the food sovereignty of their communities uh, to be able to engage in those practices that kept our people strong in all levels. So there was just this amazing sense that this was also inclusive of multi-generations of elders teaching young people about all of these historic practices, uh, especially at ceremonial levels that did help us tap into those spiritual strengths within ourselves uh, because resilience needed that component to be able to be complete. So 
um, I just found that uh, it was just really interesting and amazing. And I think it was resilience at its finest, how so many of the communities I worked with were able to use that time of profound disconnection and stress that COVID introduced to be able to connect with other things, the original things that we had as a people to be able to find life, to be able to help each other, to be able to connect with the land. And, and I think the greatest testament to that was, I just wanted to share a couple examples here. Uh, what I saw were there, I, I really saw all of those things expressed. Um, I, I work with one group uh, still in Georgian Bay, and I was really amazed that uh, this group, which works with so many different indigenous communities, one of the things that they did in that time as they encouraged young people to come together, think about their own cultural places in the world, think about standing up and looking for, looking after their land, looking after their animal relatives, was a turtle restoration project. And it was encouraging young people and, and uh, community members to be attentive to turtle nest and turtle crossings and putting up signs and building advocacy and awareness uh, about you know, these very profoundly ancient relatives who have important roles in our ceremonial societies. But there was this experience that um, I, I saw and, and I had as young people were helping to gather turtle eggs from sites where they would be destroyed and were helping incubate those eggs and learning all of the ceremonial rites that went around that and then helping upon the hatching of those turtles to return them to their sacred places, be able to speak to those turtles in their own indigenous languages, languages which we understand, our animal relatives understand, and give them return to the world and return to the future. So it was just this amazing experience, I think, um, in all of this time of helping me rethink what resilience is from the ways that I am trained as a scholar to think about them, seeing these organic and real and authentic connections that communities are making to finding strength and belonging connection and helping others build that, and that it extended beyond human community. It extended to finding ways that uh, sturgeon could refine their ways upstream again, and seeing the sturgeon guardians emerge as in the Wisconsin indigenous community as a, as a multi-generational force that is helping sturgeon return to their spawning grounds. Um, so in some cases, ones they haven't been able to reach in a hundred years because of damming or other development issues. So as indigenous peoples, resilience has been about combating those very things in many cases that have created climate change issues, but also helping repair the damage of that and empowering ourselves and our animal plant fish water relatives. So those were some of the things that I just wanted to add to this discussion as we think about this. So thank you all. Thank you so much, Brian. Um, really, you know, interesting perspectives um, brought forward from those who are living and experiencing and also trying to change um, the conditions to make their communities more resilient. Um, so we are now going to segue into the Q&A discussion section of the session. Um, I just want to sort of really frame a lot of the overlaps or at least put a shine a light on the overlaps of what um, our wonderful speakers have brought up today in terms of themes. And, and I can just sort of like list them out, right? And then we can maybe open it up for questions from the audience. Um, a lot of the concepts um, in terms of the ways that we move forward to building more resilient communities, some of the themes that came up were around kindness, um, connection to place, building a strong social fabric, um, a systems level sort of multifaceted way of thinking about resilience then, and then also solving the problems um, that come from the shocks and stressors that we face. Um, respect and belonging, re-engagement, um, reciprocity and reconnection. I think the, those sort of um, themes run across all of the presentations. Um, and I think, you know, now that we are moving into the discussion phase, this is a way that um, we, could, we can think about how do we actually put this into practice? Brian, you offered um, some examples of how that's happening. Um, and what are some other ways that communities can sort of like take these higher level concepts around resilience which I think are really important um, and implement them in practice so that we can move forward. 
All right, so um, let's take the first question um, from the, the Q&A chat. Um, this is from Kelsey. Dr. Hampton, have you found a challenge with implementing this level of intentional care, the equity lens specifically in healthcare to address disparities of health? Or do you see a shift or a signal of change beginning to happen in healthcare? I think both. Um, healthcare rarely does things unilaterally um, uh, or, or not unilaterally, en masse. I'll say the, the COVID vaccine is probably one striking um, counter example, but otherwise, pockets of healthcare move um, in, in any given direction. Um, and, you know, that is definitely a critique of the American healthcare system um, that we have pockets of folks who are, um, who are applying this lens generally, and then we have pockets of folks who haven't heard of it yet. Um, and we, um, then there's, then there's sort of the the friction of I've been doing it for a while and I see that it's a great idea like come on let's go and well I just heard of this and I'm halfway through my hiring process or you I don't want to do this now um, and so I would say that in general there is a shift toward more awareness for issues of equity and inclusion in healthcare but that it is definitely um, uh, uh, people are coming along in departments and, and divisions and regions are coming online in different, at, at different paces from one another. Great, thank you. All right, the next question we have is from Mark. Um, hi, and this is specifically to Brian. Um, hi, Brian, inspiring that you went on a fast. Um, if you were to plan a global hunger strike to address the climate crisis and to address the hopelessness that is building, how would you do it? Or what changes would you make from your first fast? Any lessons learned? Or did you learn that hunger strikes are actually not effective and can further the anxiety mm -hmm. and trauma? Thanks so much. Oh, that's a fascinating question. Uh, thank you so much. I think one of the things that uh, we think about with, you know, Again, uh, measures of building awareness and resiliency, and and the role that culture can play in that. Um, you know, fasting is a practice done, you know, by indigenous peoples, in which we we go without food, we go without water for a sustained period of time, um, which offers us a period of profound reflection. We sit somewhere in a, a sacred place, or deep in the woods, or by a lake. Uh, usually in a small lodge that's built, but it offers this moment of pause and reflection. And we go without physically to strengthen our spiritual awareness and our spiritual perception of the world. Um, we also know it, it helps the earth, it helps ourselves, it helps our community when we do that, when we can bring back understanding to people and share that understanding. Um, in terms of a global food strike of sorts, or hunger strike of sorts, I think that's one of the things that does go along with fasting is being hungry because that does happen, that moment of intentionally going without. But it's also that kind of um, awareness that you build within yourself, that kind of spiritual practice, that ability to reconnect and pray and, and uh, then do that on behalf of community for that greater good. So I think it would be amazing. I think if everybody in the world was able in, in countries where we, we have, of course, enough uh, to be able to have that kind of pause, to be able to really think about where the food that we enjoy every day comes from and what our connection to that is, and to have to go without as, as many people across our planet, unfortunately, have to do every day. But it also helps us sort of build that pause and reflection on the world and where we fit within that and what our impact is on the earth. So I think in, in countries where there is excess, it would be amazing for everyone to have that kind of pause, uh, but to do it in a way that does intentionally nurture that kind of reflective thought. So we don't just go hungry, but that we become aware of the circumstances and that we wanna change that for ourselves and for others. That would be my recommendation. 
Great, thanks, Brian. Can you also um, share the Ojibwe word um, describing let's stand strong and tall together? That was another question. I will put that in chat. Sounds good. All right. Um, so we have a question um, in the chat from, and I hopefully don't butcher it, Anti Capitalista. That's a great um, tag name. I'm wondering how to build or identify a community. Here in Germany, most people are lonely. There are subcultures, but most people don't even talk to their neighbors. My ancestors were probably Nazis, so I don't have a connection to that either. I know it sounds depressing, but most people I know here feel isolated and as if personal struggles are too much in the way of being able to live in community. So Beth, would you like to respond to that question? Um, yeah, I can maybe share a few things. Um, I think I've heard it referred to here today and it's definitely well-documented the, the impact of loneliness in many of our, especially Western cultures, um, which points to another opportunity for multi-solving um, because many of the strains that are put on either our mental health system or our physical health systems, um, if, they, if they are traced back to loneliness, then the potential for the same community that we need to get through tough times and shocks comes to mind for, um, for addressing that as well. And I, I think the, the questioner is asking, how do you do that? Um, and I, I think it's an organic process that starts small in my experience. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to start with disaster preparedness. It can start with um, a tool library, you know, neighbors sharing tools to get things done. It can start in my town, um, you know, the public library is a center of community that's also a resilience hub. It's it's one of the few accessible air conditioned spaces in a state that, um, you know, isn't used to high heat days, but we're having that more. So I think what I'm trying to stress is that it doesn't doesn't have to be complicated and can start in small ways. But I would be curious uh, from Brian, Adrian, or you, Tisha, um, other thoughts about that. Adrian or Brian? That's okay. We can, it's a deep question and we can keep thinking about it. Um, I think this other question that's coming from uh, T. Callahan is also related. Um, how should kindness and justice coexist in the spirit of resiliency? Um, the question is for all panelists, but specifically speaking to Adrian's meta med meditation and uh, Brian's mention of the importance of kindness. So anyone want to jump in on that question related to the first question as well? Um, I'll take a stab at it. <laughs> um, so... I mean, from, from Dr. King, we have the wisdom that love, or justice, I'm sorry, is love in action. Um, and I think um, that we can look at, um, I think we can look at kindness in a similar way. Um, I think, um, that sometimes it is difficult when we want to exact justice or when we want to right the ship with a decisive action um, to remember to bring everyone along and to um, work from a stance of loving kindness so that we're not alienating people along the way. Um, and so I think they have to work together um, so that as we are bringing about a more just society, we are not doing that in a way 
that is short-sighted and leaves people behind um, just trying to flip things on their head. Um, and so that's where I would leave it. Thank you, Adrian. I just wanted to add a couple of thoughts to the end. You know, there's so many different ways to think about that construct of justice, uh, you know, depending on your perspective, your work, your profession. In some ways, justice could be perceived as being this, you know, very unemotional, cold, removed experience that is based purely on facts. And again, objectivity. Um, <laughs> but that, that other way of thinking about justice, of course, can also be from the perspective of, and I think the word that somehow resonated with me in that was just this reconciliatory action, this reconciliation of terms and making things right again. And I think absolutely uh, kindness is a part of that. And as is being open to the construct that perhaps what makes something right again might be something very, very unexpected. Um, and, and maybe one classic example that actually just came up from a really wonderful community set of interviews I was doing this morning uh, before this panel, but getting to work with some folks on the Menominee Reservation here in Wisconsin, uh, just thinking about reconciliation, you know, of boarding school era terms, um, you know, that did so much damage to communities at many, many levels. But perhaps a way that we reconcile that is helping through build immersion schools to empower children who haven't had access to learn their access or opportunity to learn their language for generations to put that back, that that could be justice, that could be reconciliation, that could be a way to make things better. And I think that also that making things better, making things good again, that's imperative to justice. Great, thank you guys. Um, and this is also building off of these two previous questions as well um, from Carolyn. I would like if the speakers address the issue of individualism in contemporary American culture and how um, the physical structures of the places that we live in thwart those connections. Um, the lack of third spaces where people can come together in public existing third spaces that have taken a, a big hit um, during COVID. Um, so much of life in the United States, um, and it seems also in Germany and other places, so much of life in the United States is structured around work and family life, not the development of public life or connection or essentially community. What are your thoughts on that? One thing that... Um... I reflect on, and sometimes I use the words climate individualism versus climate collectivism. Um, and so as someone socialized in white America, um, I, I find that at the moments when I feel most despairing about climate change, if I root around in my mind, I usually find one of those seeds of climate individualism, right? Which is, I have to fix it myself as though I'm going to somehow single-handedly do something about these global problems. Um, uh, and that leads, I think, directly to like, we're gonna consume our way out of this if we just buy the right electric vehicle or something. Um, and climate collectivism is both a better source of understanding. It's like the rules and incentives that we've either agreed to or been, been forced upon us are what are creating these trends and we can collectively undo them. Um, and so for me, the shift is from I just have to do my part as well as I possibly can and know that there's beings all over earth who are doing their part. Um, so that's my systems brain answer. I'll also just give a personal answer, which is um, for now almost 25 years, I've lived as part of an experiment among white middle-class Americans to live more collectively. So I live in a community of 20 or so families who share land and a farm um, and buildings together. We do things like have some, some of our meals together. Um, this month in August, um, all the families with young children organized a day camp and each, uh, each of us who has no longer children at home are, are doing a, a little you know, art project or a nature walk or something. Um, so it's hard and a struggle. And uh, maybe as Brian talks about people in his community having to relearn languages, um, I think all of us probably have ways that we need to relearn being collectives, but it can be a great adventure too. I just had to affirm really quick, Beth, I loved that word adventure. 
And, and I love giving this a new challenge for us to think about and to think about in as positive a way as we possibly can. And I, I you know, this sort of just relates to finding those ways that when we do come together, when we do create spaces for a collective action, that it, it is done with greater care now. It is done with a greater intentionality and, and it is a greater adventure. So I love the positivity you help uh, give the voice to um, in that. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, and, you know, we have kind of like covered a number of different sort of either community assets or institutions that can help facilitate a more kind oriented, connected, collective approach um, to rethinking how um, community resilience can be built, like faith based organizations, the creation of more third spaces, for uh, like the longest table or community camps, I really like that idea around immersion schools and integration schools. Um, but here, here we go, we're going to throw in a question from Melissa. I'm um, thinking about building community with those in close proximity and back to the loving kindness meditation, extending it to those who have harmed us, right? So we're talking about people who are sort of already on board or willing um, to engage in this new way of, of living with one another. Um, but how do we do that and extend that to those who have harmed us? I would love to hear strategies you have for building community with people who may be concurrently doing things that actively harm you, exact examples like related to racism, violence, or not taking COVID precautions or harming the environment. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions on how to approach this? I think we have to we have to find in ourselves the will to explore our commonalities and interdependence with folks who also um, are doing us harm. I don't think their life is just too nuanced. I can't imagine that there are no commonalities. There are no ways in which we're similar. We have no common interests and all I'm experiencing is harm. What I can absolutely identify with in myself as I feel this question in my body is um, that the harm being done can be louder than anything else. And so for, for me, I have to sit quietly and intend and, and allow myself to see the fullness of interaction and where I have common interests, where I can find common stable footing um, with a person or group I feel is doing the intentional or unintentional harm. Any other thoughts? I, I just wanted to say one thing that's com coming to mind for me, or maybe two. Um, I think there is a kind of fierce loving kindness that stands in the way of harm um, that doesn't have ill intent toward those doing the harm, but also says you're right now a danger to yourself or others, and we're not going to let that happen anymore. Um, I don't know the strategies exactly of that, but that's the a feeling that rises up in me to that question. Um, and the second uh, thing coming up and I can only sort of point in a direction, but I just noticed how these questions seem to put most of the action again and again on the people who are being harmed when of course um, there's so much opportunity to put that that need for action in the other place, you know, the people who are either benefiting from systems that are harmful, um, at least they feel like they are in the short term. Like we're getting toward the end game of empire and capitalism and it's starting to hurt everyone. And so one of the ways out is for people who may have been benefiting to recognize that was a false sensation and a temporary one. 
Um, so again, I don't have the strategy playbook, but it feels like we're getting to that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just one quick question, or one quick comment to that question. Um, it made me think a little bit of our term that we use in our several of our languages for a greeting term for each other. And the word is bojo. It comes from when a bojo, who was a great cultural heroic figure who first walked the earth and named everything and helped form the world and give shape to things. And while this being was fundamentally flawed in many ways, at the heart, this being was kind and good. And so when we say that bojo, which comes from when a bojo's name, we try to acknowledge those flaws in ourselves and others, but also more fundamentally and importantly, we try to see the goodness in each other from both sides of that. And that can change things. Absolutely. Um, so we have about six more minutes left in our session. And I think this is a great question to sort of close out the session um, with our focus uh, mostly on community institutions, on individuals in communities that have been harmed or affected. Um, but what is the role in, of institutional structures, higher level governance essentially, um, in fostering resilience in addition to these community-based and individual strategies. I've heard resistance, this is coming from Kelly, I've heard resistance to our focus on resilience as only necessary because these institutions are failing us. We've been really uh, interested and focused at Multi Solving Institute of trying to learn how these solutions that seem to address so many problems at once come into being. And so we've been looking at the bright spots in different types of global scans for multi-solving. And most things we find are different everywhere. There's definitely not a recipe, but there are some commonalities. And one of the key commonalities is this spanning of sectors and boundaries and disciplines and scales. And so it's community groups in relationship with formal centers of power, like a municipal government. Um, and one of the things that we look at as a defining characteristic of multi-solving is multi-directional flows of resources, but also of knowledge and relationships. And so what that might look like practically one day is, you know, the city manager has the floor and is teaching everyone else, but the next week it might be the grandmother from the community who also knows where the water goes and what the flooding problem is with as much authority and, and as much deference. Um, so I don't think it's institutions are good or bad. It's um, what are they there for? Who are they serving? And, and are they woven into a fabric of community and accountability? All right. Um, so I think we are almost um, to the end of the session. I just wanted to add one more uh, thought, even though I'm the moderator, I just wanted to add one more thought. Um, and it's sort of related to a lot of what Brian was talking about in terms of the schools, I think, sort of training those that are coming behind us to live in this new world of change and disruption, um, and integration to be able to work and connect across um, race, across gender, across ethnicity, across places, across experience um, in a way that is equitable, um, in a way that is thoughtful, in a way that's kind and connected is going to be really important. So I think we also need to shift sort of the way that we educate um, the, the youth and the young people that are going to become professionals in this new, um, you know, in this new set of conditions, of environmental conditions. Um, and I, as sort of a, as a faculty member that's thinking about community engagement, participation, justice, um, try to sort of build that into the coursework that the students do, that these, pro these problems and these projects are really complex. Um, there's not one solution. You don't have all of the answers. Perhaps those that are experiencing these impacts also have knowledge that is valuable and can be used and brought to the table in an equitable way, in a respectful way. Um, and that it's a long game, that the, the you know there's not just one fix and there's not sort of an immediate fix that you kind of have to continue to be committed um, over a really long time to, to move the needle around change. Um, 
so uh, if anybody has some sort of final reflections on on our general panel for today or anything that we haven't covered that you'd like to share i'd like to open that up now otherwise you know thank you so much all of you for a really fascinating session i've learned so much um and thank you to the audience for these excellent thought-provoking questions to help keeping us think of thinking about different ways of understanding um, community resilience, how we get to that point, what it takes, um, how we actually sustain it and implement it, um, and how do we move forward in sort of pursuing and moving the needle towards more um, resilient communities. So uh, I, I thank you very much again. Um, you know, I'm just going to reiterate uh, what we started off our discussion with, with be safe, be happy, be healthy, and live with ease, um, and take care of yourself and uh, of each other. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Tisha. I did not expect to get as emotional as I did in this session. I mean, I think a lot of the comments in the chat are sharing the same thing. It was so personal. It's amazing. It just brought to life how community is personal. Community is us, you know? So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Um, thank you, Tisha. What a great job you did holding all of it together, all the wisdom and compassion. Um, and the last thing I want to say that was really present for me, I think for a lot of people, is how each one of you brought the ancestors and the coming generations into the dialogue and made sure that they were also present here. That was really powerful. Thank you. <laughs>